Amen, amen. What a blessing. Well, uh, Molly was telling stories on me there. <laughs> what, what do I do about that? You want to hear some stories about Molly? No. <laughs> No, we better not. Okay. Let's move ahead, though. How many of you are having a great time at camp meeting once again this year? What a blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. I snuck away from camp meeting for just a little bit this morning. It was uh, sermon prep time. Uh, After I had read over my notes a few times, that is, uh, Danny told me where a pond was that I could uh, dip a hook in. And the Lord blessed with uh, 14 largemouth bass that are all still alive. We turned them back loose. And, uh, you know, that helped me get ready for today. I'm much more relaxed, and uh, fishing is a blessing to me. Just getting out and being with God, you know? What a blessing and the relaxing time being here, seeing people I haven't seen for years here at camp meeting. It's absolutely awesome. It's great. And I know that you're getting a blessing with all these uh, wonderful speakers that have been here and the things they've shared. I'm excited to share with you again today. Uh, And I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, as we get into our message titled, Elijah has returned. When I was 16 years old, it was the first day of spring break, and I had borrowed my dad's car. It was an exciting thing. I had a driver's license, first day of spring break. Guess how I started that day out? Bass fishing. Yeah, it's true. It stuck with me for quite a while now. I went fishing that morning, and uh, back then I kept them, you know. I brought them home and and, uh, made sure they were ready for me to uh, check on them later. And, uh, well... uh, I then was uh, going to town. There had been a little bit of a rain, and my friend Chris, we were teenagers, he'd called me up and said, let's go play some tennis in the afternoon. I said, that's great. Let's play some tennis. And uh, he said, the courts will be dry in a bit. Why don't you pick up a pizza, come over to my house, we'll play some video games, and and then we'll go play tennis this afternoon. Uh, That sounded exciting to me. So I headed off in the little Toyota Corolla of my dad's. It had a little sunroof on it, and I thought it was cool, you know, to roll that sunroof back. And I had the music up loud. It was country music back then. I, I know, please forgive me. And um, I, was, I was down in the seat, relaxed with my arm up, just cruising. I was going about, uh, I started around this curve in, in backwoods, South Mississippi. And as I was going around this curve, there's some potholes in the curve. And so everyone kind of just moves over automatically to the center of the road to miss the potholes, which is what I did. And then I look up as I'm adjusting the radio, trying to get the tunes a little more lively. I look up, someone is out there too, in the middle of nowhere, coming from the other direction. What are they doing out here? It's the middle of nowhere. Well, now I have to choose a side of the road. I say, you can't go wrong going right, so I jerk it to the right. I wasn't going all that fast. It was a sharp curve. I was only going 80, 85, something like that. And (laughs) I missed the car, but the car I was in began to fishtail. As an inexperienced driver then, I I overcorrected when I tried to get back onto the road. And as the car began to fishtail, it went off the road, hit a ditch. I went through the windshield headfirst, hit out in front of the car, just to the right of the uh, electric pole. The car went just to the left as it flipped end over end over end over end. I actually hit in the front yard of my Baptist preacher's house the parsonage, and I come up running from the car. I knew it was coming behind me. I run right up on the porch. I hear screaming inside. Someone had heard the collision and seen the, seen the uh, carnage, and I, I rang the doorbell because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> they, they came out. They got me laid down, started putting rags on me. You know, I was cut up from my knees to the top of my head, having gone through the windshield head first, which is uh, typically not very healthy. Oh my, 147 stitches from here to here. 
But before they put the stitches in, they brought me the phone to call my mom. I said, if you call my mom and you tell her I've had an accident, she'll wreck getting here. So let me call her, right? So I'm mom, you know, the car's in pretty bad shape. And well, the important thing is, is you can talk, you're going to be okay. And she gets there in record time. They take me in the ambulance and they begin to do the, the x-rays. And since I went through uh, the windshield head first, they turned me this way, my neck, right after everything had begun to kind of knit and dry. About 40, you know, they start stretching this way and that way, taking the x-rays, right? They determined a miracle, nothing was broke, I was just all cut up. And they put me under for seven hours of plastic surgery as they dug glass out of my face. Plastic surgery, you'd think they could do better than this, but it's, it's what I have to work with. I think the mistake that my mom made was she gave them a picture of what I looked like before the accident instead of a picture of what someone better looking looked like before the accident. But just before I went under for seven hours of surgery, my dad came in. You see, when he had heard I had an accident, he ran out to get in his car to come check on me. It was his car I had borrowed. That was the first day he had ever loaned me his car when he went to work, so he wasn't used to his car not being in the parking lot when he went out there. He had to borrow a car and come over. And my dad, he just didn't get it right. He just messed up a little bit. You see, there's this, there's this script that you don't even have to look at to know how to follow. That's right. The teenager says, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry about the car, right? And then the parent, I mean, if, it, if the kid's going to be okay, says, that's all right. Don't worry about the car. The important thing is, is you're going to be all right. Mom got it right. Dad, you know, he, he just missed it. As I was getting ready to be put under for seven hours of plastic surgery, he started out right. He said, uh, don't worry about the car now. But we will deal with this later. Well, see, I went off course, and it caused a severe accident. Now, uh, I could tell you to just really quick, that accident is what uh, began a series of events that caused my family to begin to study, and we studied ourselves from the Baptist church to the Seventh-day Adventist church as Adventist Christians now. In fact, my dad had to ride with someone else to work for a few days, and he heard a, a 30-second Amazing Facts ad for a seminar by a speaker by the name of Brian McMahon down on the coast. And uh, they didn't mail flyers out where we were. So he was riding with someone else when he heard about it. I had a few days off from Piggly Wiggly where I worked. They still have those. They didn't want me with 147 stitches from here to here around open food. So they told me to take a few days off. And, and I got to go and, and hear the Amazing Facts speaker. And, and I thought it was pretty good, but I didn't get to keep going. My dad did. And I, I basically learned these are really nice people. And it seems like they really understand the Bible. But it seems like they go to church on the wrong day and don't eat anything that tastes good. So that was, <laughs> that was my impression. And so it, it took me a few years of continued study. But what happened with me is I had gotten off track, right? I ran off the road, and it caused severe problems. I had gotten off course. Well, Israel, many, many, many years ago, had gotten off course. And God sent a mighty prophet to try to bring them back on course. That prophet's name was Elijah. Our message today, Elijah has returned. About 2,800 years ago in the northern part of Palestine, there lived a mighty prophet of God by the name of Elijah. Elijah was courageous and bold. He faced head on the current of popular thought. His soul was weighed down uh, with a burden for God's people, he, they had forsaken the commandments of the Lord. They had followed Baal. And he called them back to the true worship of God. At this time, Ahab was the king of Israel. He had married the wicked princess of Phoenicia, Jezebel. 
Now, Jezebel had killed all of God's prophets that she could. She made it illegal to worship the true God properly upon the penalty of death. And the people were serving God a little bit while mixing in much of the pagan world around them, just like we see much of the Christian world doing today. Well, as you move ahead and study the prophecy of Elijah, he was not popular in his day to those who were against God, and he was not even popular to many of those who professed to be following God. There was a death penalty upon his head for three and a half years, three years and six months for 42 months. For some of you, that just gave you a clue as to where we're going. And then when his work was finished, he was translated directly to heaven without ever seeing death. And once Elijah was translated to heaven, the Bible is completely silent about Elijah until you come down to the last two verses of the Old Testament. And like a show that you may have been watching years ago, and and right when it came to a climactic point, and you're thinking, oh, oh my, what happens? Then it says, to be continued. That's what God did. The last two verses of the Old Testament, he says, by the way, Elijah's coming back. The end. For 400 years. What if you had to wait 400 years to see the next episode? Oh my. But look here, let's read it. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. For behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Before the second coming of Jesus, in power and great glory, Elijah is going to return. But what did God mean by saying Elijah would return? How would it be fulfilled? Well, regardless of how, the fact remains, if God said Elijah's going to return, then Elijah's going to return. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Yes. But my friends, as we look here, I can think of four options. Maybe you can think of a fifth. Perhaps God might send uh, Elijah personally. Number two, perhaps God might send someone who looks like Elijah. Number three, I highly doubt uh, these, but these last couple, but uh, maybe he, Elijah might be reincarnated into someone else, some have suggested. Uh, fourthly, perhaps Elijah's message might need to be repeated, and the repeating of that message would serve the function of Elijah's return. Regardless of which option we discover to be the truth, though, the fact remains the prophecy will be fulfilled. Now, Elijah is mentioned 28 times in the four Gospels, and he's mentioned 30 times in the entirety of the New Testament. And as one studies those verses from the Word of God, you come face to face with a startling fact, and that is that the prophecy of the return of Elijah has a dual fulfillment. That is, it has a double fulfillment. It has how many fulfillments? Two fulfillments, that's right. As we look here, going into Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, as we dig into this amazing prophecy from the Word of God, we look here in Matthew 17, starting in verse 10. And his disciples asked him, the disciples of Jesus asked Jesus, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias, Elijah, must first come? And Jesus answered instead unto them, Elias, Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah just come already and they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed likewise shall also the son of man jesus suffer of them then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of who john the baptist so you go and you ask jesus who's elijah and he refers to who john the baptist Well, let's ask John about it as it's recorded right here in the Gospel of John, not written by John the Baptist, but written by the Apostle John, John the Beloved, John the Revelator. That's right, John 1, verse 19. And we find the question being asked here of John the Baptist right here in the Word of God, in the Bible today. We see it crystal clear. We look here in... uh, 1 John, not 1 John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19. And it says, 
And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou who? Elias, are you Elijah? What did he say? No. No. Then they said unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? Let's reread it. They asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? He saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? He answered, No. Then they said unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Or Isaiah. And so... Jesus, you ask him who's who's, uh, Elijah, and he refers to John the Baptist. You go to John the Baptist, you straight up ask him, are you Elijah? And he says, I am not. We've stumbled upon one of those seemingly apparent contradictions in Scripture, but there's no contradiction there whatsoever. As serious Bible students, we know what to do right away, do we not? And that is to look at more verses on the topic and let the Word of God make it clear. In this case, we only need one more verse. Go into Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. As we look here together today, Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 13. Luke chapter 1, verse 13 today, here it is. Luke 1, 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, this is the father of John the Baptist, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name, what? John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, And many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Remember he said uh, he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. He's going to turn the hearts of Israel to the Lord their God. And he this is John the Baptist, shall go before him, Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the spirit and power of who? Elias, of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and this disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so it's clear. John the Baptist was not the same man as Elijah. He did not, it doesn't say, look like Elijah. He was not Elijah reincarnated. He came with the same message. He would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so we have our answer. My friends, you're looking for the message of Elijah. Now, as we talk about this, remember John, when he was asked who he was, he said, I am a voice. What is the function of a voice? To communicate, yes or no? He said, my identity is not important. It's my message that is important. As Christians, my friends, we each in our own heart must come to the point that self is not important, but it's the message that points to Jesus that's important. John the Baptist had that down, praise God. And he said, I am a voice. Well, as we move into this, we're going to talk about the prophecy of Elijah. We're going to look back at Elijah, the original prophet. To keep it simple today, we're going to call him Elijah number one. Then we're going to have John the Baptist. We're going to call him Elijah number two. All right, there's logic here. Good. And ultimately, we're looking for the fulfillment of this prophecy. And in this prophecy, it's amazing to note that it says the ultimate fulfillment of Elijah's message is just before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Not the first coming of Christ, but just before the second coming of Jesus. Right? And so we're looking for Elijah number three. That's right. Elijah, my friends, has returned. But I ask you, have you seen him yet? You say, I don't know if I've seen him yet or not. My friends, what if I said that you may have seen him when you've looked in the mirror? Are you to give the message of Elijah in this world today, yes or no? 
Yes, you are. Remember, you're not looking for the return of the same person. You're looking for the return of the Spirit and the power. You're looking for the return of the message of Elijah. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, that to this lost and dying world, God has sent the message of Elijah. Let's dig into this and begin to unpack it. First off, I want to share with you that Elijah himself is used very uniquely in Scripture. Some of you may have studied and read how that Hosea, the relationship between Hosea and his wife as God told him to go marry a harlot was to represent the relationship between God and Israel who was unfaithful to him, right? Well, Hosea lived out a literal prophecy that represented something that would take place with God's people. Did you know, although it's not as overt that it doesn't necessarily just jump out at you the first time you read about Elijah, that Elijah, in some respects, did the same thing and that his life would actually represent and play out what would happen to God's people? Oh, it's true. There are some symbols here. Don't miss this fact. Elijah was in the wilderness hiding from Jezebel for three years and six months, 42 months. We're going to look at that in Revelation in just a moment. And when Elijah's message and mission were complete on earth, he went directly to heaven without ever seeing death, yes or no? As will happen with the Christians who are still alive when Jesus comes. With this in mind, let's go to the book of Revelation. We're going to look at some of the symbols first before we jump right into the literal story of Elijah now. Look here, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. Looking at the clock, I need to move ahead a little more quickly for you today. So Revelation chapter 2, and you can find it here in verses 20 to 23. It says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and will give unto every one of you according to your works. Notice Jezebel. Jezebel, the original Jezebel in the Bible, had died long before. This is a prophetic symbol. This is a woman in Bible prophecy. What is a woman in Bible prophecy? A church. This is a corrupt woman, so this would represent a church with corrupt teachings. This is over the time of Thyatira, my friends, which if you've studied the seven churches, is the time of the Dark Ages. A corrupt woman that would rule over God's people during the Middle Ages. That's what you're reading about here. Jezebel, when we go to the story of Elijah, is a symbol of that same power that's also represented by a woman in Revelation 17, Revelation's great harlot, who also has children there. She's the mother of harlots and commits fornication there as well. Now... With this in mind, I would like to have you turn with me here for just a moment and look at another verse. As we look here together, go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Historically, Jezebel of Revelation persecuted God's people. And it's happened already. It will happen again according to Bible prophecy. Now we look here in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness into a place where she hath, uh, she hath prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, twelve hundred and sixty days. Repetition and enlargement. It's repeated again in verse 14 with different terminology. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time. That's a year. Times, that's plural. That's two years. And half a time, that's half a year from the face of the serpent. That is three and a half years or 42 months, which on a biblical calendar was 1260 how many days? How many days? Yes. And then, of course, we saw in prophecy, I have seen that uh, Numbers 14.34, Ezekiel 4 and verse 6, a day in prophecy is a year. But we're just talking about days right now, 1260 days. You say, what does this have to do? I thought we were talking about Elijah. Elijah has returned. Oh, why are we sitting here? Why are we looking at this? Go with me to the book of James, chapter 5. And then we're going into the story of Elijah. I promise. Go with me to James, chapter 5. If you're looking for that, you'll get there by going Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1st John, 2nd Peter, and then James. Right after the book of Hebrews, coming from the other direction, okay? We want to give you time to find it. We'll see it here together. And we read it here in the Word of God. And we see it in the Bible today. It says in uh, James chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Elijah, Elias, Elijah, 
was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and... How long? Three and a half years. That's 42 months, yes or no? Now Jezebel is used as a symbol of uh, the persecuting church in Revelation. And Elijah was literally in the wilderness for the same amount of time the church will go into the wilderness in the book of Revelation. Time, time, and dividing of time. Time, time, and half a time. 1,260 days, 42 months. Now, as we delve into the story of Elijah, you've seen what the two major players here literally represent to us. Elijah represents God's faithful people throughout the New Testament. And Jezebel represents the persecuting, corrupt church of Revelation. Now, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and have some fun getting into the Word of God. Let's go here together. 1 Kings chapter 18, we look at it in the Word. We're going to start in verse 17. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Now why would he be asking him if he's troubled Israel? You see, here's what happened. God told Elijah to go tell King Ahab that it's not going to rain for three and a half years. He didn't say stay, he just said go. And so what did he do? He went marching into the throne room of King Ahab. King, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Then you know what he did? He left. You see, you should always listen to exactly what God says. God didn't say, go and stay. He said, go. So wh what did Elijah do? He left. He probably figured a good run's better than a bad stand. At least that's what I figured. Now, if God says stand, we stand. But God didn't say stand right then. He said, deliver the message. He got out of there. They looked for him for three years and six months trying to kill him. And then when that time period's up, Elijah confronts King Ahab. And Ahab says, are you the one who's troubling Israel? Now, Elijah was no pansy. He said, no, I have not troubled Israel. Verse 18, but thou, but you, and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Notice the one who was keeping God's commandments was blamed for the trouble going on. We'll develop that one possibly later, but let's move ahead. Now, the, the union of Ahab to Jezebel represents the last day union or fusion or amalgamation of not only Christianity with paganism, but the union of church and state. Now, we move ahead and we see it clearly. It says here in verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel and Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the people, all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Now history tells us that Mount Carmel was a center for sun worship for the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, the Greeks, and the Romans. They all considered it a sacred place for the worship of the sun as you in God. But Elijah was not afraid of their God. He happened to know a little known secret, and that is that one with God constitutes a majority. <laughs> That's right. And so he went up there, one man against 850 false prophets. That's right, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove. Now, we read on here, they were worshiping the prophets of the grove, a Canaanite goddess, okay? And uh, they were still worshipers of Baal, uh, but they did it a little differently in that they were dedicated to the goddess, okay, of fertility. Now, verse 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people, and he said, How long haught ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people answered... Him not a word. Now let's think about that for just a moment. As we look here at this, this is very intriguing. They answered him not a word. Sometimes God confronts people with a message of truth, calling them to Jesus, their Lord and Savior, to make decisions and to put away false teachings and false practices, wrong practices. And when they look at the decision, 
They are halting between two opinions, and they don't have a thing to say. They're just frozen. That's what was happening here. But notice, God, the true God, is different from the false God, the sun God, Baal. The prophets of Baal and Jezebel had been killing those who were faithful to God. Yes or no? The prophets of Baal, they said, you know, Baal is, 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 is cruel, he's mean, he's rigid, he's harsh. And they were just acting the way they thought their God was. But what does God do? He's long-suffering. All this time, Elijah's been hiding in the wilderness from Jezebel. God has been laboring with his people. He's long-suffering. He's loving. He's merciful. As a Christian, you're probably going to act like, most of the time, the way you relate to people, what you think God is like. If you think God is rigid and mean and cruel, then you're going to treat other people at home and at church that way. Therefore, if you don't understand the loving character of God, it's important that you get that together because you're misrepresenting God if you don't see it. But if you believe that God is loving and merciful and He's calling you to Him because He loves you with an undying love and He loves you so much that He would rather lay down His life even if it would mean losing eternity Himself than enjoy heaven without you. That's my God. That's the one that I serve. I look forward to spending all eternity with Him. And that's what heaven's about. It's about being with Jesus. That's the long-suffering, loving, awesome God we serve. And I am drawn to serve Him because I love Him, not because I have to. Now, as we dig into this, we see here verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Later we learn there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, but you know what the point of this is? It's very simple. In the last days, there's one truth. What, what is that truth, my friends? The truth, it's very simple. Jesus, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. Well... The Word of God, the Bible, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is the truth. And God's law, Psalms 119, 142, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And all thy law is the what? Truth. My friends, when you read one Bible, one set of Ten Commandments, and you worship one Savior, that leads you in unity to the truth of the Word of God. That's right, my friends. As we dig into this, uh, he said, I only remain a prophet unto the Lord. There's, there's just a, the hint there of something for us to see. Now, verse 23, Let them therefore give us uh, unto us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves. So they each took a calf, and uh, then they would call on uh, God, and the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And the people, they said it's well spoken. If you read on down in the narrative, we're skipping down to save a little bit of time here. It says here in verse uh, 26, And they took the bullock which was given them, the prophets of Baal, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal for morning even at a noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! I'm just trying to read it right. <laughs> but there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar that was made. Did you get this? Now, now, folks, I'm trying to get you to go there in your mind. Use your imagination just a little bit here today. You're on top of a mountain. All Israel is gathered there, and you've got 850 false prophets. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the grove, and they say what? Oh, Baal! hear us and they're leaping and they're jumping around you know wow wow you say you're acting up no i'm not acting i'm trying to get you to see that you're not seeing it yet 850 <laughs> sweaty screaming men before the days of daily baths and deodorant 850 smelly sweaty Screaming prophets, false prophets. Well, verse 27, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's on a journey. Or at peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Your god's taking a nap or your god's on vacation. 
So, so God told Elijah to go stay there all day, but he didn't say be bored, and he didn't have CNN or Fox News or nothing. And so what does he do? He kind of stirs it up a little bit. Verse 28, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. They cried how? Aloud. Now you've got 850 bloody, sweaty, screaming men. Are you with me? Are you there? Are you alive today? Check this. This is amazing. Notice they shed their own blood to please their God. Look at the difference between the God these false prophets worshipped and the true God. My friends, I was asked by a man at the gym the other day, what's different about your church? And I I usually would just say, well, seventh day and the Sabbath and Adventist Jesus is coming soon. I decided to have a little bit of fun. I said, well, what's different about my church is what we believe about who God is. And then I stopped. And he sat there five minutes in the sauna. And he was shifting his weight. He was was baited and he was trying not to ask. He finally said, okay, I have to ask. What do you mean that what is different about your church is what you believe about who God is? And I said, we believe God's a lot more awesome and a lot more loving and a lot more kind than a lot of other churches believe. That's what we believe. And then I began with seventh day and the Sabbath and what creation as opposed to theistic evolution says about who God is all the way to Adventist and him coming soon to set it all straight and set it all right. And, and throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, he would never take away your freedom of choice or my freedom of choice, but he's doing it in such a way that sin will never rise up again. He said, I had not been a religious fellow, but my wife is, and I I like the sound of that. I might come see you one Saturday morning. I know where you're at. I hadn't seen him yet, but we're hoping to see him sometime. Now, check this out. We move ahead. Verse 29, it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. In verse 30, Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that's broken down. What do you do at an altar? You worship. Notice Elijah's message always restores true worship. Okay? Now, then he put the wood in order and uh, he prepared the sacrifice. The sacrifice points forward to Jesus. That's right. You see Jesus all in this prophecy. The loving character of God is here uh, dripping from every page. We see it. He said, now, pour four barrels of water over it. Is that generally the Boy Scout juice you use? You know what Boy Scout juice is, right? You know, some fire starter liquid, you know, like when you're grilling or whatever. Boy Scout juice. Maybe some diesel. Don't use gasoline. That'll blow up in your face, literally. Okay? Four barrels of water. He said, do it the second time. They did it the second time. Do it the third time. Did it the third time. Twelve barrels of water. Twelve stones for the altar. Twelve barrels of water. We're lively stones, yes or no. Water represents cleansing. There's some, perhaps some allusions here to the 144,000 if you see this as a, not only a literal story but having prophetic value. I won't, do not have time to fully develop that thought right now. But let's look here. Then it says, verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. Remember when it said Elijah was going to come and he's going to turn the hearts of the people back to God? That's what Elijah's message, the key portion of it, is. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. Uh, The Lord, He is God. And that's verse 39. My friends, let's look at a couple of parallels very quickly here. And then we'll go into some final important points. You have Jezebel, which is used as a prophetic symbol. A woman in Bible prophecy is a church. You see Jezebel's role as a persecuting power here. Okay? And you see her ultimate end. Oh, incidentally, at the hand of her own people, just as you find after plague, after plague, after plague is poured out, that the waters dry up, that that ultimately Jezebel in Revelation meets an end at the hands of her own people who turn against her. Okay? Three years and six months. You see that, right? Elijah in the wilderness as the church would be in the wilderness for three years and six months. Famine. There was a famine for 1,260 days, my friends, in the days of Elijah. And while the church was in the wilderness, there was a famine of the Word of God. 
Ahab's marriage to Jezebel, a symbol of the union or fusion or amalgamation of Christianity and paganism as well as church and state. Um, the showdown on Mount Carmel, I believe it represents the Protestant Reformation and the finishing of the Protestant Reformation because I don't believe it's done yet. I believe we are still Protestants by God's grace. The prophets of Baal shed their own blood to please their God, salvation by works. The twelve stones and the twelve barrels, I believe you find a cleansing and a purification of God's people. The fire that falls, my friends, we're waiting for the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall for the latter rain to go forth in power and glory. And I believe the drops of rain are beginning to fall. Incidentally, along with the fire actually came a rain right after the fire in this case. Remember, he went and prayed seven times for rain. Seven times. Seven completion when all of God's people are seeking and pleading for God's Spirit to be poured out. It will be poured out. That last time, his servant said, I see a cloud about half the size of a man's hand. Oh, wow. And he said, get up, it's about to rain. And he runs, and the rain begins to fall. My friends, although it was a challenge of faith for Elijah, do not miss this point, Elijah fled Jezebel the second time. The church has went into the wilderness for 1,260 days already, has come forth. But once again, there will be a time to flee to the mountains and rocks in a time of tribulation, yes or no? Elijah fled Jezebel the second time. It's there. Don't miss it. Then, my friends, Elijah, when his work was done, was translated to heaven without ever seeing death. And those of us alive to see Jesus come that have been faithful to Him and given our hearts and lives to Him, we, like Elijah, will be translated to heaven without ever seeing death. Amen. Praise God. And looking for Elijah number three, you're looking for the same message. What was he saying? Elijah said, you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Don't miss this point. In the days of Elijah number one and Elijah number two, all of God's people lived in an area roughly 30 miles wide by 90 miles long called the land of Israel. And one man could take the message to all of those people. In fact, the old circuit-riding preachers in the early time of, of uh, the United States, uh, they would cover two or three counties or four counties, which is easily 30 miles wide by 90 miles long, yes or no? But we live in a prophetic time where the gospel message is going to go to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. It's going to take an army. It's going to take a movement to preach Elijah's message. And thankfully today that movement is almost 20 million strong and growing, fulfilling every criteria of Elijah number 3. And that movement, my friends, is the Adventist church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen. Raised up by God, a movement of destiny. And we're calling Seventh-day Adventists and all Christians back to the true worship of God. And yes, I said Seventh-day Adventists too because there's some Seventh-day Adventists that aren't worshiping God according to the way they know they need to, that aren't being faithful in following the Lord and walking with Jesus step by step. And we're living in the last days, my friends. We'll soon be with the Lord. And this prophecy is being fulfilled very rapidly. I have ten points for you to consider. Number one. Elijah's message comes at a time of great religious apostasy. There was great religious apostasy in the days of Elijah number one. What about when Elijah number two, John the Baptist, came along? Was there religious apostasy? Was Jesus at all pleased with the outward form of religion? They knew what to eat and they knew what to wear, but they didn't have their hearts right. Uh-oh. Yeah? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. My friends, we ought to know what to eat and we ought to know what to wear, but it ought to be because our hearts are right. That's right. Praise God. Number two, Elijah's message comes at a time when many worship services are loud and full of commotion. Now, they're not all that way today, but there's enough to see the parallel. Yes or no? My dad was talking to a fellow that told him, man, we were at church and uh, well, we got to singing, because that's the way they say it down where I'm from, singing. And then 
the Holy Spirit fell and we started jumping pews. They would jump pews at this particular church. He goes, and one fellow jumped a pew and went almost all the way across the room and hit this elderly lady, knocked her down and broke her arm. Man, that was a powerful church service. My dad said, well, you ought to come go to church with me. He was inviting dad to church. He goes, well, actually, you ought to come go to church with me. I'll introduce you to one that will set you down fully clothed and in your right mind. <laughs> Number three, Elijah's message stands in the minority. The majority follow a false system. Number four, Elijah's message is directed to the professed people of God. Seventh-day Adventist Christians, let me speak to you for a moment. We hear this idea out there today that we just need to preach to the unchurched. Let me tell you, God passionately loves the unchurched. We should be preaching to the unchurched. But the call out of Babylon is a call to away from any religious confusion that exists out there, even among the popular churches of today. And if you, my friends, turn your back on issuing that call, you've turned away from Elijah's message. Elijah's message was directed to the professed people of God who had forsaken the commandments of the Lord. That's right. Number five, Elijah's message proclaims that the majority of God's people have done just that, forsaken God's commandments. Number six, Elijah's message would be unrecognized by most of the religious world. John the Baptist preached it and they cut off his head and even the 12 disciples were asking Jesus, when's Elijah coming? Unrecognized by most of the religious world. Number seven, Elijah's message preaches righteousness by faith. Coming to Jesus and being forgiven just as you are, whereas the prophets of Baal shed their own blood to please their God, indicative of salvation by works. That's right. Number eight, the people of Elijah's message are blamed for the trouble in the world. I wish I had time to develop that now, but I don't. Number nine, Elijah's message proclaims that the coming of the Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming soon. It's time to get ready for Jesus to come. Are you doing that? Are you spending time with Jesus every day? Are you walking with Him? Do you get up and have time with Him before life gets hectic every day? Are you falling in love with Jesus anew? I mean, it's one thing to study doctrines. I study them every day, my friends. But I've come to realize we don't need to use Jesus to teach the doctrines. We need to use the doctrines to teach Jesus. Amen. Growing closer to our Savior. Uplifting Him higher and yet higher and higher still. Our Savior will be lifted up. Amen. In fact, in Revelation chapter 18... Look there with me for just a moment. Revelation chapter 18. We see it here. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Revelation 18 and verse 1. And we'll look at it together very quickly. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Just like the three angels' messages, this loud cry of the third angel, this fourth angel, some might say, uh, this repeating of the second angel's message, verse 2, when it says Babylon is fallen, my friends, this angel represents a movement among God's people. And it says that the earth will be lighted with His glory. When Moses asked to see in, in Exodus 33, I believe it is, the glory of God, God calls His goodness. His mercy, His love, His character to pass before Moses. My friends, we're going to take these truths that we've been preaching in the three angels' messages and we're going to lift them up to exalt the glory and the love of God, the character of Jesus. And the earth will be lightened with His glory. And Babylon will fall, verse 2. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. But my friends, not because we bash other people better than we have in the past but because they see Jesus uplifted in the truth and the false doctrines appear destitute. And lastly, my friends, Elijah's message calls for a decision. 
Now the decision is yours. Will you make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Thank you for your time.